So the next thing I need to do is to get this nice turbulent fluid motion to affect the movement of our particles. And the tool for doing this is here on the Drive Particles tab, and it's called Advect. So let me select that. And I need, first of all, to select some particles. And it's done that. I press Enter. And I then need to select uh, the fluid box. Now I've disabled the display of my fluid box, so let's just enable that. Select that and press Enter. And it does some calculations. And an advect by volumes node is added to the end of our pop network. And let's just say briefly what this is doing. It's taking the velocity field from our auto dot network. Let me enlarge this so we can see this. It's then taking the objects created by the smoke field. In fact, that's just smoke. And taking the velocity field of that. So that's the velocity field that is going to apply to our particles. And we can control uh, whether this updates the position, the force, and so on. And we can control how significant its effect is. So let's see what this looks like. And, of course, because I'm in the bot network, it's not showing me the results of the auto.network. Let's turn off the display of that, go into the auto.network. And it's probably giving us a little bit too much. So let's change the behavior of that. So that it let me rewind it so that it updates the position rather than the force and let's give it a scale of 0.8 and let's go back into our auto network and see what happens and that's a bit more like it And in fact, we can render this to see what it looks like. So let me first of all, on the material palette, lay down a constant shader. And I'm going to use point alpha. I'm also going to turn the opacity down a little bit because I think it would be too high. And then going back to the object level, I'm going to turn off display of our smoke object and turn off the display of our box. So we just have our sphere and turn back on the display of the pop network so that we have the particles. And by the way, uh, here uh, we can see that the pop network has a DOP import after it. So in fact, what we're getting at the end here is not uh, the pop network as simulated inside here, but the particles after they come out of the auto dot network. So let's advance it to say frame 15 and then let's take a quick render. And I'm going to need to create a camera. So I'm going to control click the camera button and we probably also need to create a light even though we're not going to be using it at the moment. So I'm going to insert a distant light. And let's render that and see what we get. Um, the other thing we need to do, because these are being rendered now as small spheres, is on the geometry node of our pop network, I need to go into the render tab, the geometry sub tab, and select a select render as points and it's they're still a bit bright let me go into our constant shader and turn down the opacity even more I could do this obviously by controlling the level of the opacity inside the pop network but this is just a little bit quicker
And the reason that this isn't uh, having an effect, of course, is because I made a fundamental error, which is that I have not assigned this material to my particles. Now we'll probably find that I reduced the opacity by a bit too much. But there we are, we can get a sense of what it looks like. So that's looking reasonably okay. So I think that's enough work on constructing a particle simulation which is simulating some ink or something flowing through a fluid. And just to say that obviously the effects that you see commercially require a great deal of attention to tweaking the various noise fields and the fluid simulation to get a, an effect which is just right. And uh, I'm not uh, doing that in this tutorial. Uh, in fact, I, I'm not expert enough to to say exactly how that's done, but broadly this is the kind of technique that's used. So let's move on and talk now about how to render out the millions of particles that are required to produce one of those smoky effects. So the key to rendering millions of particles is not to attempt to bring them all into Houdini at once but to combine them only in the final render. And before we get into that, there are a couple of adjustments that we need to make to our pop network to make sure that it's going to look good when millions of particles are going through it. So I'm going to go down into the pop network, Let's stop that from re-simulating. And one of the things I'm going to do is just add a parameter here on the birth tab, I'm going to select accurate births, and that means that the position of the sphere is going to be recalculated for every single particle that's birthed from its surface. And that helps eliminate some of the, occasionally you get an effect whereby you get a series of rings as the particles are released in bursts rather than continuously. The other thing I'm going to do is just lay down a position pop and I'm going to apply this only to the particles that have just been born. So let's move uh, down to position 2 and we should see that there is now a group here to select. Well that, that's not coming through but I know birth group exists and what I'm going to do is just for that initial birth, I'm going to add a little something to each of the components of the position. And what this is doing is making sure that every particle has a slightly different position. and avoids any chance of them grouping together. I'm just adding random numbers here so that we get a different random value. And This will just offset those particles minutely just as they're born, uh, which will help avoid any artifacts as they overlap. So that, uh, that should have sorted that out. The other thing that I'm going to do is to increase the number of Substeps that the particle solver is going to take, and I need to do this here on the pop solver. So down here we've got oversampling. I'm going to stick that up to four. Again, that helps ensure that we get slightly more accurate movement of our particles. So let's now concentrate on how to get our particles out of Houdini, and I'm going to do this in a two stage process. The first is to create a geometry ROP, and the second is to create a wedge ROP. And I'm going to point the geometry ROP here, sorry, point the ridge ROP at the geometry ROP. And what a geometry ROP does is write out 
the node, the, the, the geometry of a particular SOP node to disk at every frame. And I'm going to put this in a geo subdirectory. And I'm going to call it particles dot. And then I'm going to introduce this variable dollar wedge. And there's a tutorial on the side effects website about how to use the wedge rob. But essentially, it varies a parameter in your scene and renders out uh, a new set of frames for each different value of that parameter. And the value of the parameter broadly is contained in dollar wedge. Or at least there's a bit of text which tells you what the value of the parameter is. And the SOP path I'm going to use is, of course, our POP network. So that's the geometry set up. This will then render out uh, for each frame. And I'm going to set the frame range to 1 to 40. We'll render out for each frame uh, the geometry from the POP network. And the wedge rob allows you to change the value of a parameter. And I'm going to change the value of the parameter here on our pop solver, which is the random seed. So in order to get the address of this parameter, if you like, I'm going to copy it. And then, whoops, and then on the wedge node, I'm going to paste copied relative references. Now, in fact, it's not this channel function that I need. I need the address directly. So I'm going to take away the brackets and quotation marks from that. And let's give it a value of, let's say that we're going to do five of these. And I'm not going to use random samples. I'm going to use five steps. So this should ensure that uh, it will evaluate with this, the random seed, at zero. It will then evaluate it with it at one, two, three, four, five. So we get five different calls to this geometry ROP, each of them writing out data, uh, and each of them doing 40 frames. So the next thing I need to do is to create a take, which is going to increase hugely the number of particles that we are creating. So let me call this something massive. And then uh, in our pop network, uh, on our source, I'm going to include this in our take. And I'm going to increase it to 50,000 particles per second. So at the end of 10 seconds, we'll have 500,000 particles. 20 seconds, we'll have 10,000 million particles, rather. And then at the end of 40 seconds, we're going to have about 2 million particles. In fact, uh, of course, I'm misstating that calculation. It's a four-second long simulation. So this would only end up with 200,000 particles, so I'm going to increase that, say, to 100,000 particles a second. And the other thing I might want to do is increase the resolution of my smoke simulation. So let's include this in the take and increase it up to 40, like so. So we've now got a take uh, which we can use in our geometry network. In our geometry ROP, rather. Let's revert back to the main take. And let's make this render with massive. So that's going to run our simulation. I'm going to initialize simulation ops. It's going to run our simulation using that very much higher level of particle emissions. And it's then going to save the result to disk. And I'm going to let that 
render out, which will take um, probably several hours, and then we'll come back and demonstrate how to use this to create our render. So let me just render that wedge by clicking on the node at the end and selecting render. And that should start rendering out those geometry files. And note, by the way, that you'll have to have created a geo directory in your hip directory for this to work. Um, but that's going to plow on through, and that will take quite some time. So I'm going to pause the video. Well, in fact, that took uh, a whole night to render, about eight hours on this machine, which is admittedly not a very fast machine. So the first thing I'm going to do is just test that those files look broadly correct by loading them in. So I'm going to switch off the display of my pop network, and I'm going to disable simulation. We don't need that anymore. And I'm going to lay down just a geometry node and dive inside. And I'm going to use the file node here to load from our geo directory one of these sequences that have now been written out. And as you can see, we've got a sequence with a dollar F in it. That's because we've got show sequences enabled here. So it's not showing us all individual files. It's just showing us a single sequence. And we can see they've got 40 frames there and the seed of naught, seed 1.25, 2.5, and so on. So let's just load in the first one of these. And then let's dump to, say, frame 15. We can see we get a huge number of particles. Slightly difficult to tell uh, the shape of those because a lot will depend on the particle density. But we can see that's that's working correctly. So I'm going to switch off. Uh, in fact, I'm going to just delete this so that we don't uh, unnecessarily have it loaded in. Now, I need to do two steps to bring in this geometry in a way which can be used by Mantra, which, but which does not actually require the geometry to be loaded into the Houdini interface here. Because if we did that, we would probably crash Houdini because we're trying to process too many particles at once. So the first step I need to do is here in the shop context, where I need to lay down some mantra geometry shaders and the shader I want is mantra delayed load and I want the file to be this one and I'm going to use velocity motion blur because I've got some V attributes on those particles and I am not interested in sharing the geometry because this is only going to be instanced once I'm going to control C, control V this to copy and paste it five times like so. So we've set up the first one. For the second one, we're going to want this second. The third, the third one, we're going to want the third. The fourth one, we're going to want the fourth. And the fifth one going to want the fifth, like so. So what we should have now is a shader for each of the geometry files that we wrote out. So I now go back into my object uh, level, my scene, and I need to lay down a proxy object for each of those shaders. Because what a procedural delayed load shader, mantra delayed load shader, does is load in, you could write out, for example, just a sphere, and because this is going to have, the sphere is going to have this shader applied to it, Mantra will ignore the sphere and will instead load in directly into the renderer uh, this geometry and render it. So let's just try creating some proxy geometry. And to make this neater, I'm going to lay down a sub network and let's call this proxy geo and I'm going to dive inside and I need to just lay down a geometry node it doesn't matter what's inside it uh, and I'm going to assign that shader to it now you don't assign the shader here in the re rendering material 
part of the geometry node, you assign it here in the render geometry sub tab. And what I want to do is bring in the MGO file one. And the other thing I want to do, as you'll recall, is to render this as points. And again, I'm going to control C, control V that. And for this one, I want file two, control C, control V, file three, control C, control V, file four, and control C, control V, file five. Now notice that we're not applying any transformation to any of these nodes. And the reason for that, of course, is that our original POP network that we're saving out didn't have any transformation applied. So we must make sure that our proxy geometry is the same, like so. So what we should have done here is set up a node of proxy geometry, which is just, this occupies virtually no space in Houdini, but when it's rendered out, the renderer will load in those particle files. So let's now have a look and see what a render looks like. In fact, before I do that, I'm going to need to apply a shader to these nodes. As you can see at the moment, they've just got the default material. So I'm going to select all of them. And you can do this in Houdini. You can set the parameters of a number of nodes simultaneously. And I'm going to choose the constant material that we had earlier. And then let's try a render. And this is going to take a few minutes to load in that geometry, so it's going to take a little while. And now we can see it loading in. And we can see that we've probably got a little bit too much opacity. So let me try going to the shader and reducing the opacity further. So let's take it to a tenth of what it was earlier. And let's try rendering again. And that's a bit more like it. We're getting a bit more variation now in our smoke or our particle flow. So that's looking all right. I, I might want to delete uh, this ball so it doesn't show up in the render. But we're getting a nice flow here around the ball. So let me render out a few frames of that and uh, then come back. So let's have a look at the result of that render. So I'm going to load up mplay, go into the pic directory and load this up. And I'm going to set it to 10 frames a second and set it to real time. Now this may not show up terribly well in the video, so I'm going to show you at the end a render of this directly to the video. Let's see what that looks like. And we can see it's got some quite nice movement, in fact, some quite nice, quite nice effects. So as a final step, I want to demonstrate how to modify your shader so that it can take account of shadows. So let's go into the shop context, select the constant shader. I'm going to control C, control V that so that we get a copy. And I'm going to call this, for example, particle shader. And let's dive inside. And again, now, as you can see, this is slightly more complicated than we need for our particles. For example, it involves two texture maps, one for the opacity, one for the color, and we're not using either of those. But we need to insert in here a, a lighting model, something which will take into account uh, the lighting of the scene. And the node we want 
is a lighting model mode. And let me hit P to bring up the parameters. And there are a number of different uh, lighting models. Now, in general, you can't, for particles, use most of these lighting models because particles don't really have a well-defined normal. They're little spheres, so their normal is, a, is, is not really very well defined. So you have to use something, a lighting model, that doesn't require a normal. And the isotropic volume lighting model is what you want. And this is only going to take account of your diffuse color. It's not going to take account of anything else. So let's pop this here. Let's connect our paint, which is going into here. So in other words, the basic color of our particle into the diffuse component, and then bring the color out and put it there where the diffuse component was going earlier on, uh, where the paint rather was going earlier on. And what this should do is ensure that our particles can both receive and cast shadows. So let's uh, try that out. Uh, I'm going to lay down a grid to just demonstrate that uh, we are casting shadows correctly. And the other thing I'm going to do is just turn up the opacity on this maybe to point 0.1 just so that we can see the effect more clearly. And obviously I'm going to need to assign that to all of my proxy objects. So let's go in, select all of those, and move this to our particle shader, like so. And the other thing I need to do, of course, is have a look and see what our distant light is doing. And we can see that it's quite closely zoomed in on the scene, and we're going to need to give it much more space. And select it, and go to Shadows. I'm going to use Depth Math Shadows. I'm going to give it quite a bit of blur, and I'm going to increase the quality maybe to say 5, and the softness to 3. And let's make it quite big, because uh, we want to make sure that it's reasonably detailed. It'll take a bit longer to render because of that. We've got transparent shadows enabled. That's important, because obviously we're going to need to take into account the alpha of the particles. So let me look through our camera again, and we're on frame 14, and let's render a frame. And what we should find, this will take a little moment to come up, what we should find is that those particles are now both casting shadows and receiving them. In other words, there should be a little bit of self-shadowing going on. And obviously it takes a moment to generate the shadow map. And as soon as it's done that, it'll come up. There we are. And it should start rendering the main scene at any moment. And we can see it's beginning to do that. And hopefully we should begin to see a bit more variation in the particle cloud, which is caused by the fact that we have a light which is casting shadows. And we can already see down here that there are some shadows. And we're beginning to see here that there are some shadows too. And underneath here there are some shadows. So this is successfully casting and receiving shadows. So that really brings us to the end of that how to render millions of particles. I hope it's been useful.